I would regard him as a major international figure, perhaps our greatest draftsman since, well, we're talking about the 18th century. He's my hero, he's still my hero, and I, 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 it was him, I think, who had the biggest influence on my work. His eye, it's comic, but it's absolutely penetrating, and uh, just the draftsmanship is utterly superb. It's the, the sheer sort of brilliance of a certain kind of linear draftsmanship, which tells you more than, than a thousand words. He really skewers his subjects without in any way actually demeaning them, which is very rare. Uh, I think he's just a genius. He is the cartoonist cartoonist. He is the cartoonist illustrator's illustrator. Cartoonists have put a smile on the face of the nation even in its darkest hours. None has done so more successfully than the man widely accepted as Britain's finest, Ronald Searle. In 1945, Britain was exhausted, a country changed by war. This was the land to which the 25-year-old Searle returned, having spent three and a half years as a prisoner of the Japanese. I immediately began to rush around and uh, try to earn my living as a freelance artist, and also to find out what was going on uh, in the world, or in Europe at least, uh, while we'd been cut off completely in the jungle or in prison. Searle's mordant wit and distinctive style were an instant success. By the early 1950s, he was in constant demand and his creations were even more famous than he was. His St. Trinian's girls lurked on every street corner. His advert stood 50 feet high in Britain's towns and cities. And his barbed cartoons and carefully observed reportage were appearing in magazines and newspapers throughout the world. He used to keep a, a schedule of his deadlines and it was uh, just unbelievably complex because they were tumbling over one another. At the height of his success, Britain was described as a soul-haunted land. His work had caught the mood of post-war Britain and still provides a telling commentary on those troubled times. That's what Searle achieves, a wonderful encapsulation of this post-war period in British life. Very grey period, very stuffy, very height-bound by class division. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't explode that, but he punctures it. Searle is often described as the most typically British of British cartoonists. And yet it's also a cliché, probably because it's true, that the best cartoonists are outsiders. So how much of an outsider was Ronald Searle? Anglia, a part of the country the artist himself has described as being rather eccentric. Perhaps even more significantly, he began life as a townie amongst the gowns in the gentrified university town of Cambridge. Born on the 3rd of March 1920, Ronald was the first-born child of William and Nellie Searle. William worked as a porter at Cambridge Railway Station, and Nellie took in lodgers to make ends meet. As soon as he could pick up a pen, he began to draw. To this day, he credits the foresight of his primary school teacher, Miss Green, for allowing him to use his left hand, where others would have bound it and labelled him cack-handed. His family were not an artistic family, and he was encouraged by his mother who spotted his gift for drawing. Uh, and there was a sort of tolerance of that, which I think was a remarkable thing, given that his family had no contact or understanding of what possible career he could have. His father was a fairly formidable character, tough constitution, which came in useful later with Ronald, of course, because he had a lot to survive. He had, I think, something of his father's resilience. He was a, a local boxing champion known as Buller Searle, which sounds very 
East Anglian to me. I think it must have been a very pleasant university town. There were lots of original streets, houses, rows of um, shops, which have now disappeared, sadly. He would have had quite an interesting cultural input from those things, but also contrasting a bit with the fact that his parents had to have lodgers, and there was a lot of pressure on them to, uh, well, I believe he rolled cigarettes, he and his mother rolled cigarettes to actually pack them to make money. So there was this sort of contrast between the modesty of his background and the ordinariness on the surface, and then the rather pleasant, relaxed, grand quality that Cambridge would have had in those days. Young Ronald and his little sister Olive became inveterate museum goers, haunting the halls and corridors of the Fitzwilliam Museum in the heart of Cambridge. Ronald in particular wanted to replicate this experience, so he'd built his own little museum at home and, and, and put in as many treasured things as he could find. Uh, Somebody gave him a grapefruit once, which he'd never seen before. So he put that in the museum, and the next time he looked at it, it was a giant ball of grey fluff. So he had to throw it away. But things like blackbird's eggs, and he would marvel at the blueness of the, this blackbird's egg, and so on. So it's a, a very typical children's thing to do, but knowing Ronald, it would have been exquisitely done, and each thing would have had something marvellous about it. It was here in the Fitzwilliam that Ronald claims his fascination with graphic satire was born in a room devoted to the works of Max Beerbohm. As a child draftsman, I mean, he drew all the things that everybody does, like the dog or table in the kitchen or something quite mundane and ordinary. But his drawings were possessed a greater acuity of observation and, and reflected a, an almost, not adult, but certainly mature understanding of how things were made. On leaving school, Ronald got a job as a solicitor's clerk, but with the support of his parents, began attending night classes at the Cambridge School of Art. The teacher, Miss Horsley, seized on him with enthusiasm because of his dedication, his obvious talent. He was also sufficiently well developed in terms of his reading and his ideas. He'd been to school, he'd done part-time work, he'd done jobs of various kinds, so he, he was not a an impressionable pupil in that sense. He had actually thought a lot about what went on around, so I think he must have been joy to teach. Searle's early perseverance had paid off. Just a few weeks after beginning his night classes at art school, he had his first drawing published in the Cambridge Daily News. It was to be the first of many as he quickly became their resident cartoonist. At the age of 15, Ronald, who was not slow in coming forward, uh, dropped uh, a portfolio of his stuff through the editor's door with no further comment and left it at that. And the editor, to his uh, eternal credit, saw that there was merit in these things and took him on. Not everyone was so keen. The solicitor's firm sacked him for drawing on their legal paper. So instead he turned to the less demanding environment of the local co-op. Every day he would return from his job as a parcel packer and draw all night. The following morning, Olive would be dispatched to the editor with the night's work, as Searle caught up on his sleep. In 1936, still only 16, Searle broke a Cambridge taboo and became the only non-student contributor to the prestigious undergraduate publication, The Granter. We really uh, needed a, a cartoonist. And this kid came along, and, uh, well, we jumped at him. And that was Ronald. I suppose, like any kid uh, of 16, 17, it's a bit of an act of bravery to simply go in and say, will you give me a job, or can I show you my, uh, my drawings? He fit in very well. I mean, uh, especially as he visibly had a very good sense of humor. <laughs> In 1938, Ronald was awarded a full-time scholarship to Cambridge School of Art. He willingly accepted and left the co-op to become an artist. We'll be... The icing on the cake came when the Searles moved to a new house on Cambridge's Collier Road, a mere stone's throw from Ronald's beloved art school. To have this flavour around you, as well as the flavour of an art school, you can understand that between 15 and 19, there's a certain influence, isn't it? you begin to absorb, which uh, make you start thinking, which is the, if you like, the whole flavour of a university town uh, having its impact on a mind that um, was wide open 
extremely simple, but still rather determined that it was going to become an artist. In the first months of his scholarship year at art school, the trainee artist took the fateful decision to volunteer for the Territorial Army, Royal Engineers. During his first year at art school, war broke out, and Sapper Searle was called up, giving him no choice but to give up his formal training. We were both uh, called up and in a sense an East Anglian division, and uh, we were going around, mostly around different parts of um, East Anglia, not doing very much until uh, the summer of uh, 1940 when we spent a good deal of our time doing things like putting down mines and uh, explosive uh, charges in, in case the Germans expecting the German invasion. Despite being on active service, Searle continued to draw profusely. I think the habit of keeping sketchbooks came to him during um, art school training where it was obligatory. You had to submit one at the end of the term and so on. And he always kept a miniature one with him after that. And, of course, with battle dress, there are lots and lots of pockets and, uh, and plenty of room for that. And thereafter, he always carried with him a sketchbook. They became numbered as war sketchbook number one and so on in, in sequence. Searle so spent the early part of the war on training exercises throughout the British Isles. It was during a posting in Scotland that what was to become his most successful cartoon was born. He was billeted with a family in Kirkcubri in the south of the country whose daughter Cecily attended an Edinburgh school called St. Trinian's. His ambitions just before the war had grown to the extent where he'd been hawking himself around London offices. And he did this for two years solidly without any great success. And then these little magazines started to proliferate as, uh, as the war approached and, and indeed began. And he began to get the odd acceptance and he was sending things. He sent some to his future wife. He didn't know she was, but Kay Webb uh, received some and started to print them. Well, though he didn't see, I don't think, anything seriously published before he went off to war. In September 1941, 21-year-old Ronald Searle boarded a naval ship in Gurrock on the west coast of Scotland and sailed to war. Events at home and abroad were gathering momentum. While Searle was at sea, unknown to him, Kay Webb published what was to be the first of many Ronald Searle cartoons in the popular magazine Lilliput. He was uh, very unlucky in that he arrived in, in Singapore just before Singapore fell. And it was, oddly enough, on the streets of Singapore, as it was falling, with the Japanese on the outskirts of the city, shells falling, smoke everywhere, chaos reigning that he saw on the ground a, f a fragment of a, a Lilliput magazine with uh, one of his cartoons, a Centrinian's one, the original Centrinian's one of the girls clustering around the notice board saying due to the present circumstances the, the match has been called off. Enemy force defeated in landing on the western shores of Singapore last night. Fighting continues. On the 15th of February 1942, Singapore fell to the Japanese. And after only a month of fighting, Ronald Searle, along with thousands of others, was captured and forced to march for three days to the end of the Changi Peninsula, where he was imprisoned. Early on in our captivity in Singapore, uh, the Japanese quite suddenly ordered everyone to sign uh, a form which solemnly declared that they will not, under any circumstances, attempt escape. Someone <laughs> discovered the the horde of forms that we'd all signed and stole mine back for me. And uh, I sketched a couple of Japanese on it. Searle continued to beg, borrow and steal his drawing materials throughout the war. Keeping his creative spark alive may have been what sustained him throughout the horrors that lay ahead in the years he was to spend as a prisoner of war. His head was obviously full, full of images and 
um, full of, of, of passion for observation. I think, I think there was almost a compulsion there. I mean, it was the way psychologically that he survived those horrific experiences. Searle was one of many thousands unlucky enough to be selected for forced labour on the infamous Siam, Burma, or Death Railway. Searle and his colleagues made the miserable journey from Changi to Bampong in Siam by train. Hundreds of men died in awful conditions as they were crammed into metal carriages in oppressive heat for six days. Those who survived the journey were then forced to march almost 200 miles through inhospitable jungle before being put to work on the railway. There were so many people dying at the time that you lost count. You just couldn't remember who they all were. Starvation isn't funny. And I used to spend most of my time thinking up means of stealing food. And after all, we were only stealing our own rations, which the Japs had taken over. The men weren't just subject to starvation. Extraordinary acts of brutality and torture were everyday events. To have been discovered documenting such goings on would almost certainly have led to summary execution. The Japanese smashed his right hand, but sticking a pickaxe in his back and seeing that he got beriberi and dysentery and Dong syndrome and all these things. He smashed his right hand, of course, he was left-handed. The thing that kept me alive was the fact that I was able to draw and I wanted desperately to bring back a picture of what was happening as there were no photographs. And not for one moment did I think that I wouldn't be able to come back and show this to somebody to show exactly what did happen to my friends. So lost many friends during his time on the Siam Burma Railway. There was to be no respite when he returned to Changi Prison, where he would spend the remainder of the war. My experience was simply that I woke up day after day with the men dead each side of me. Eventually, we were, all my friends were eliminated, and uh, most people I knew were eliminated. Very few of us came back. Many, many hundreds of thousands of us went up there. When they say that that railway, which was a considerably long railway, was Every sleeper represented a body, it's absolutely true. It is really quite impossible for somebody who wasn't in uh, Japanese uh, prison camps and uh, to, 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 to have the slightest idea of what it was like. Uh, one knows that, I mean, that one or two friends of mine who came back from there uh, it was a profound experience and one which they never forgot. It was starvation, it was slave labor, it was every kind of disease, uh, usually having two or three diseases at once, that was the most of the men's experience. And a complete lottery with things like the, the fly-borne cholera that the men were suffering from. If the fly landed on your piece of food that day, that was the end of you. The Japanese were terrified of getting cholera. And in about three bunks down from Searle, there was a bloke with cholera, was dying of cholera, and he would put his drawings under the man's palliasse, because he knew the Japanese would never touch it. And, you know, and one's eyes fill at moments like this because he's, he's a man suffering, but the art's terribly important. And it's not just important as a record saying, well, you know, I'm going to die, and people will see what the Japanese have done. It was because he couldn't help himself. Hiding their drawings amongst the dying was just one way in which Searle and the other artists among the prisoners managed to preserve their work. We rolled them up, put them in a piece of bamboo, which would go into a bigger piece of bamboo, wrap it with gas heat so that the damp couldn't get at it, put it in an old ammunition box, and we buried it. Despite this game of hide-and-seek with his captors, Searle continued to draw, circulating his cartoons among his fellow prisoners. Even when he was gravely ill towards the end of the war, his output never ceased. 
I do remember that there was nothing of him. It was like a, a baby or a monkey or something. He had ulcers in his hand, his drawing hand. And we thought he was dying, and, and we used to put him out... We, I say, his friends used to put him out each day on a ground sheet in the sun to sort of dry out or something. I don't know why, but one felt the sun would do something. He couldn't move, and there was no food, and he had dysentery, and, and we expected him each day to die. He was a tough little one, though. He wasn't, wasn't going to. If you can imagine something that weighs six stone or so and has no qualities of the human condition that aren't revolting, calmly lying there with a bit of paper drawing a cartoon, then you have some idea of the difference of temperament that this man has from the ordinary human being. Miraculously, Searle managed to return from the war with over 300 of his drawings intact. The drawings are quite muted, uh, but what they record is absolutely horrific. And, of course, his subsequent comments in the, the sort of publication of, of the drawings underlines quite how, how terrifying it was, the physical and the mental deterioration that he experienced and saw all around him. And when we look at those drawings now, we know that he survived, although many didn't. But when he made those drawings, he had no notion that he was going to survive. If you look at the stuff that he came back with, the drawings from the prison camps and the drawings in Japanese, and compare them with the relatively simple uh, sort of student-type uh, drawings that he did for Granta, there's no question about it that he had matured. He didn't allow the expression of much emotion. I don't think anyone who was in that situation did. They couldn't afford the luxury. And they, when they came back, they couldn't talk to anyone who hadn't been involved because it was so ghastly. You couldn't start to explain something that was beyond explanation. So his drawings were really his means of survival, his um, raison d'etre for having endured it, uh, and, and the part of his apprenticeship as well. It's a very remarkable kind of combination of importances, I think. ambition was, if anything, redoubled, and a lot of that ambition was to change the world, or at the very least, the Britain he found himself living in. Celebrations at the end of the war were short-lived. The country had changed both physically and culturally. Times were hard, and with rationing increased, austerity was the watchword. I think that after the war, people terribly wanted to put things together again. It's impossible for people who didn't live through that period to imagine what it was like. Half of London was in ruins. I remember my father taking me to the steps of St Paul's. He'd lived in London all his life. And you look from the steps of St Paul's, there were no buildings. It was just cellars with temporary brick walls to keep you from falling down them. Nothing. Um, and w with lives and cities shattered like that, people terribly wanted to go back to what it had been like and pretend it hadn't happened and reconstruct things. Going back to pre-war Britain was not an option. Changing things, however, was. Even before the return of many of the servicemen, the people of Britain made a radical change when they voted in a Labour government by a landslide. The Labour Party's great victory. I think the whole thing was they didn't want to return to what had happened before, and that's almost certainly why the elections went the way they did. They thought we ought to have a fresh start. When he was demobbed, Searle returned home to Cambridge, where his fledgling career still held a great deal of interest. With the help of his former teachers at the art school, he launched a well-publicised exhibition of his wartime drawings. For him, it was like, at 25, graduating from art school, which he never actually finished, and going out in the world with a portfolio. Of course, because he was assiduous and very committed draftsman, he had a lot of work to show. 
To young Ronald's surprise, he had not been forgotten in London. In fact, the little packets of cartoons that he had sent off just prior to his posting overseas had continued to appear during the war in magazines such as London Opinion and perhaps most significantly, Lilliput magazine. His career really took off when he worked was sought regularly by Lilliput. He met his wife, Kay Webb, who was a, an art editor there. And between them, I think, because she was a writer and had plenty of ideas, he was propelled into an almost immediate set of plans and ideas for his future work. Having found his niche at Lilliput and fallen for its art editor, his burgeoning career received another boost. Realising a childhood dream, he had his first cartoon published in Punch magazine. This success was swiftly followed by the publication in Lilliput of the second ever St. Trinian's cartoon, which he had in fact drawn while in captivity in Singapore. There was a big market then for anything that was inventively drawn after the war, although there wasn't much paper, but whatever there was, Ronald was getting his fair share of space on. There was, I think, a fairly uh, rapid development of what you might call uh, enterprising, adventurous journalism and media work. And it seems to me that Ronald's career took off as part of that uh, really adventurous uh, advance of uh, newspaper, journal, and uh, print media at the time. Despite having been told by doctors that his wartime deprivations had left him infertile, the biggest surprise of the year came when Kay Webb, to whom he was not yet married, discovered that she was pregnant with twins. Well, not having seen women for so long, and he naturally uh, went straight into the Society of Women, and it probably wasn't a great shock that he was uh, very soon in a relationship and very soon after that married. And also, the father of twins, now that really was a shock and a kind of imprisonment, I think he always felt. Sounds hard on the twins themselves, but... Um, it was a bit soon for that, after all that he'd been through. If Searle had learned nothing else during his time as a prisoner of war, he had learned that his work, and in particular his brand of satire and irreverent humour, could lighten even the grimmest of moods. The post-war period was one where Ron was only one of millions of people, particularly men returning from services, who needed to try to make sense of the misery of the things they'd seen and experienced. And sometimes villages or streets they came back to had vanished under bombing. So there was a kind of um, subdued anger, which had been, I think, distilled in humour. And so you had uh, examples of humour of the kind like, we'd had it more during the war, but then we had the goon show and the whole, the whole madness of the goon gang. And that was a purging, I think, of anger and... And there were young men suspended in time who were able suddenly to somehow crystallise the feelings about the world and, and try to, in a way, point the way to a new outlook. People wanted fun, you know, after the war. They just wanted fun. It's the age, after all, of healing comedy, which people sneer at now, but I think is very much in the vein of so. Well, there was a good deal of demand for more sophisticated humour, wasn't there? And to some extent, it was an attempt to break with the kind of deferential uh, culture. And I suppose what he was doing fitted in into that mood very well. I think it's fair to say that Ronald's politics at that stage were fairly standard soldierly politics and the officer class of course had become very unpopular and so um, yes there was a certain democratization of everything. Recording his wartime experiences had improved Searle's draftsmanship but this was not a time for high art or earnest commentary. The public wanted entertainment. Humour was something that could not be rationed and in the grey post-war gloom it was his quirky cartoons that were paying the bills.
By now, Searle had regular commissions for a number of publications, not least as the resident theatrical illustrator at Punch. But it was an altogether less elevated strand of his output that was finding favour with the British public. It's certainly the most influential period of his work, as far as I'm concerned. It was the sort of deliciously wicked subversiveness of the St Trinian's cartoons. And, of course, I, you know, I was a school child uh, and related very easily um, to the antics, or at least to the aspirations, uh, as it were, to be as naughty uh, as these children. <laughs> There's a wickedness to it, and even a touch of evil. Um, but Searle manages to prevent it from going too far. For me, St. Trinian's were, like, wonderful. It was, like, liberating. I thought, oh, yes, no more puff sleeve dresses and none, none of this kind of being tidy and going to the church fete and holding a tray of flowers and poses and selling these, which I did for charity. But, I mean, really at home in my dungarees. So for me, St. Trinian's were entirely natural, and I regard them now. I thought later, he was such an innovator. He saw something in women which wasn't um, colluding with an English sense of taste and propriety, which chained women, actually. He had the wit and the sort of um, humanity to see a darker side and actually allow that to come through and enjoy it. <laughs> I think they're good gags. I think they're about, I think they're about um, the incipient, um, savage wickedness of children who will revert to a savage state if, um, if left unattended. It's, he's, um, he's the graphic equivalent of Lord of the Flies. I think it tells you very little about Britain. It tells you a lot about um, um, how wicked children can be. It found an immediate reaction because it was perhaps the first time in... Uh the history of cartooning that someone had simply stated that children could be cruel, uh, disgusting, uh, inconceivably uh, un 19th century childlike. I see the cruelty in Seoul as coming from his experience in the prison camp. It seems to me an amazing human achievement, and I can't think of another parallel, of someone who has been through an ordeal, ordeal like that, an ordeal which he barely survived, which everyone now thinks of as the great atrocity uh, of the Second World War on the military side, to turn it into funny goings-on at a girls' school. You can see the, the visual pickups quite easily, things that he drew in the camps and things that he imagines in St. Trinian's. But to turn it into something that's genial, attractive, makes people laugh, when you have suffered that much, I really can't think of another artistic parallel. The publication of Hurrah for St. Trinian's, the first of the series, in 1948, was the cue for the entire nation to go schoolgirl mad. Inevitably, huge pressure was put on him to amalgamate the drawings, to consolidate them as books. They led, of course, to movies. That is an extraordinary thing. I don't think people realise... I mean, when I, now I think about it, I realise he probably is the only illustrator in the entire history of illustration. It's actually given rise to a culture, a complete universe, resolved in cinematic terms. <laughs> In St. Trinian's, Searle had unwittingly spawned a commercial monster. With the books selling in their thousands, he and Kay Webb headed for Paris on a working holiday, the end result of which was published as a Paris sketchbook. He went round Paris with his wife. She wrote and she tried to keep off people interfering with him while, while he drew. And he described, really, the atmosphere of post-war Paris in these um, marvellous drawings which made up the book. That sort of thing is... is, is very evocative. You can sort of feel you're there. You, you can feel in every line that he's actually on the spot. He's not making it up uh, from his imagination. 
After their success in Paris, Searle and Webb turned to London with a series of London characters for the News Chronicle. It was eventually published in book form as Looking at London. An examination of human nature is what he's doing. And he's doing it through this extraordinary line which looks so definite and has such rhythm and is so pleasing. And yet, if you look at it very closely, it's, it's, it's hesitant, it's full of doubts, it's, it's shaky almost. It's very, very hard to reproduce. All I know about the way he works is his line. That's what shines through. And that's always in cutting it. That's the most important part of it. And you look closely at it, which not many people do, but you look close, you just look at the jagginess, you look at the inkiness, you look at the sort of um, um, the splatteriness, the way you use it, and the way it's sort of applied. It's, it's alive. That's the most thing, that's the thing that defines it first. It, it's, it, it leaps off the page and grabs you by the eyeballs. It's melodious, I would say, because it's, it, it goes from thick to thin and then back again. Um, he's very interested in the line, and I think he's got many, many nibs and different types of uh, equipment so that he is always varying the line. What do people actually mean when they talk about Searle's line? Well, here is Hogarth's. Line of beauty. Beautiful flowing line. Well, pretty flowing anyway. And this is Searle's line, which is far more jagged. Presses down on the pen, different levels in different ways. What it shows is a fight between the pen and the paper, as if there's a sort of conflict going on which marks the whole thing as something different from straightforward art. But more typical than the line of beauty is, of course, Searle's angles. For some reason or other, these always seem to be about 37 degrees. It could be somebody's elbow jutting into somebody else's side. Or more frequently, it's just a nose. And then around that nose, you can create anything you like. You can have the eyes. And then you hood the eyes, or you put bags under the eyes, and you fit in the nostril. And in an amazing economy of line, you manage to capture a whole series of facial expressions. It's a, it's a line that goes for a walk, and I would imagine, perhaps unexpected even to Ronald Searle, but uh, he, he would have an idea in his head of what it might look like. But I think the pen is like his handwriting, and, it, um, and off it goes. Um, and then he sort of tickles it. I, it is a kind of... And then, um, and then he emphasizes bits with this... I, can, I mean, the noises he must make with his pen as he's drawing must be completely wonderful. There's a wonderful drawing just called Lines, and it shows a fist grasping a bunch of lines like lightning rods. And, and from these, and these lines are sort of almost literally electrifying um, compositions which fill the whole sheet and all the familiar cell grotesques, you know, the, the cats and the smirking nudes, um, Don Quixote figures on horseback, um, pigs. Um, but it, it, it is wonderfully expressive of this kind of explosion of linear energy and imagination. The early 1950s finally saw Britain shake off her post-war austerity. It was a good time to be involved in the graphic arts, and Searle's work rate continued unabated. He began to find new outlets across the Atlantic, and even set up his own publishing company. Meantime, to his increasing chagrin, Britain was in the grip of St. Trinian's fever. Well, St. Trinity's, I suppose, it, it was our equivalent of a kind of Disney thing. It was as big as that, because as soon as, as soon as it went into the film world, it certainly was. 
and accompanied by uh, the kind of uh, advertising events that bordered on civil disturbance. A reign of terror is about to start in the heart of London. Armed to their protruding teeth with hand-propelled hockey sticks and their old battle axe of a French mistress, a fifth column of six formers are stealthily stealing out of St. Trinian's to attempt a coup d'etat. Their French teacher insisted on taking part in the coup to see they got their accent right. The enemy is soon wiped out. Police are called to control the crowds. And General Gingold is acclaimed dictator of St. Trinian's. He felt, after the exhilaration of an, an incident like that, which was certainly attention-getting, that this was not quite the thing that he wanted to be associated with. And uh, so there was no more of that. But at the time, th th this was huge. And still is, you see. I mean, people run St. Trinian's parties now. People turn up in gym slips and so on. I don't know what it is about the taste of the British that Ronald set off, but he certainly wished it hadn't gone as far as it did. What people don't remember is that uh, there were so few drawings, it, it, it uh, really was only a small part of my work. It was, it, it was by accident a series. In the four or five years, and it was only four or five years that they, uh, they ran, there were no more than about 60 drawings probably, and uh, to me it was a, a series of drawings, but of, of no particular consequence. You, it, it tries to domesticate you and tame you, and it takes the danger out of what you do. The suffocation of success with them left him no scope. His time was limited. He wanted to do different kinds of commissions. He was getting work from America and magazines that meant reportage trips, however onerous and tiring, very exciting and taxing. And so he prepared to travel all over the world, and he didn't want to take these awkward schoolgirls with him. And he, he didn't need them in the baggage. He'd done that. In 1953, Searle joined in the St. Trinian's hype one last time. Dressed as an undertaker, he launched the last book, Souls in Torment, in which the school is hit by an atomic bomb, sounding what he hoped would be its death knell. I look on it that I was a cook who was, able, was fairly competent in the kitchen and could perhaps achieve one or two marvellous sources. One might even go into the classic cookery book. But on the side, I produced a jam tart, which everyone adored. This was the most popular jam tart that the English public had ever eaten. I had enough of this jam tart about 1952, and uh, I thought, marvellous, this is at its height. I'll destroy it all, and uh, it will disappear from my life. With St. Trinian's dead, Searle's publisher was keen to follow its success with a new bestseller. To this end, he collaborated with punch writer Geoffrey Willans, and his next big hit was born in the form of the monstrous schoolboy Molesworth. It's very rare for cartoonists to be able to work well with writers, because the object of a writer is to create a picture in the head. Searle and Willans work wonderfully together. There is never any sense um, that Molesworth uh, or any of the characters in that book are different coming out of the paragraph than they are coming off the page. It's this symbiotic relationship. For a child, they were so funny. I, I, I would laugh at um, the school dog and and the the ways teachers would torture pupils. It just seemed not exactly my experience because I didn't go to St. Custard's, but I did go to a boarding school where there were punishments. Also, he can literally draw anything. He can draw boats and, and skyscrapers and aeroplanes and um, terribly fat pigs. 
The installation of Malcolm Muggeridge as editor of Punch led to a series of special commissions for the magazine, the first of which was a modern take on William Hogarth's masterpiece, The Rake's Progress. The Rake's Progress is a series of, of, of characters, the different types of rake, and you get the complete life of the rake from birth to death. And there's just a wonderfully complete picture of the uh, sort of pretensions uh, of British life of that period. I probably saw it when I was a kid, but I didn't really understand it. Seeing it later in later life, you just see his sheer skill. It's got a sort of lightness about it, a lightness of touch, but an absolute penetrating sort of um, skewering savagery as well. Of course, the whole of Searle's style reaches a, a kind of apotheosis in his treatment of legs and the feet below them. And in Searle's case, legs and feet are almost windows to the soul, whether it's the kind of spindly spider's legs coming out of the, the top-heavy bulk of the St. Trinian's girls, or later on these enormous thick tree trunk-like elephant legs, uh, which always end in these beautiful shoes, or beautiful feet, which again have that angle at about 37 degrees, which is a sort of benchmark of, of Searle's style. And these shoes clump all the way through his career, uh, and they're strangely magnificent, but also nobody else could do them quite like Ronald Searle. That man must have been so restless in the 50s because it must have been just pouring out of him and down the scratchy nib onto the, onto the page. I suppose that's a level of, of, of graphic production and, and humour that I don't think I've seen bettered in, in post-war Britain. In 1956, Searle negotiated an extremely lucrative contract with Punch magazine, making him theirs exclusively, an unheard of arrangement at the time. Punch occupied itself with a social area about which I knew nothing, it, but it took the piss out of it at the same time. It targeted a readership that laughed because it recognised the social media that was having the piss taken out of it, but didn't think it was part of it. So middle-aged ladies in floral hats at Ascot, or men playing golf, saw these, oh, jolly funny, that really is really. But it was them. And Searle was part of that. I mean, when Searle was doing his women, extraordinary, he was much more satirical than the other punch people. His punch contract allowed him to work for European and American publications, a loophole of which he took full advantage. In 1957, he made his first trip across the Atlantic to the America of Eisenhower and Elvis. Ronald did some wonderful work, which is not known about at all here, really, for American magazines in the 60s. Holiday magazine and that sort of thing. And they were to do with... There was a great... We remember, uh, from the time there was... Uh, a great outpouring of Americans all over the globe in their uniform of, you know, Bermuda shorts and sunglasses and baseball caps and huge cameras. And I think some of the, some of the loveliest things he did were just really views of, of, of towns and in the sunshine, beautiful colours too. They did Texas and they did Arkansas. And he did these wonderful cowgirls, these amazing drunks, the, the Great Prairies, the, the John Ford, Utah, Monument Valley. He did it all. And it's extraordinary. Although Searle continued to work for Punch, his work abroad was affording him much more freedom, and he began to spend less and less time at home. He began to work in the New Yorker, in, and he worked in Europe, and um, they rewarded him more, not only monetarily, but with the reception that he got. He became a huge star in America and a huge star in Europe. Um, and very few of our homebred artists do that. He had celebrity, he had done that, he had finished that phase of his career and he wanted to try something new and I think being so visually acute also wanted to try new sights, new light which artists do want. I think he had done England.
Searle's departure from these shores was dramatic. In 1961, without a word of warning, he left home, ending his relationship not just with Punch magazine, his only regular source of income, but also with his wife Kay Webb. Choosing Europe over America as his new home, he headed for Paris, where he would stay for the next 15 years. Perhaps the hardest part of his decision was leaving his children Kate and John behind. He left a note on the, on the kitchen table, and, and, you know, saying goodbye, I've gone. And Kay and the children were away at the time. They came back to find this, a, a complete bewilderment to them. And uh, probably a shock to him when he thought back on what he'd done, but that was the only way he could do it and make sure that he did go. Well, any decision is difficult to make, but when it becomes a major decision, like whether you change your life totally, it demands a complete reassessment of life. Uh, the difficulty is to have enough clarity, perhaps, to see the problem in a detached way, and uh, to have enough clarity to, see what, clarity to see whether what you want to do, whether it's important enough to destroy something and rebuild. It was a big decision to go because he had nobody to work for. He certainly had no outlets on the continent, and yet he felt he would be regarded there as an artist with something to offer, with explorations to make, not with a furrow to plough as he'd been in up to that point, or he felt he was becoming that kind of a, you know, people would know what to expect of him here. He didn't really know what to expect of himself there. It wasn't long before Searle found his feet in Paris. In a culture that had a long and honourable tradition of graphic satire, he was finally regarded as a true artist. The night was mighty dark, so you could I can look at England now almost as a visitor, certainly as an outsider, uh, as I do uh, with other countries. In, in a way, I've isolated myself, uh, but it's given me time to um, think uh, and, and explore and uh, to absorb uh, the atmosphere in countries other than my own. On an earlier visit to Paris, Searle had befriended Monica Sterling, the woman who would later become his second wife. It was to her he turned when he arrived there in 1961. They very quickly became soulmates, and as the commissions rolled in from every corner of the globe, travelled the world together. The French seemed to take him to their hearts in the 60s in a slightly mysterious way. I'm not quite sure how it happened, because the amount of work that they were seeing nationally was fairly limited, but... Uh, his reputation built very quickly. I think that the secret was that they took on the reputation he already had from this country, but took it seriously, which we notoriously don't. We just want funny stuff from artists. But they saw him as an artist with a capital A. And he was able to put out books with titles like Anatomies and Decapitations. Now, you never have got away with that in Britain because that sounds pompous, but it's, it, that kind of abstraction is, is fine for the French audience and very well calculated for them, actually. So by 1972, he'd only been there a decade, he had a personal retrospective at the Bibliothèque Nationale. Now, that's a, that's a huge thing to happen in Paris because uh, they take those institutions very, very seriously. And so that's almost like winning an Oscar in America. These are the French. They hate the British. They hate the idea that the British can be, actually be good at art because art is what Frenchmen do. So is he, I think, the only living foreign artist ever to have a retrospective of the Bibliothèque Nationale. The French taste suited Searle's aspirations and liberated his drawing style. He remained in Paris until 1975, when Monica became ill with cancer. Since then, the Searles have lived quietly in a tiny village high in the mountains of Provence. Proof that the French had accepted him as one of their own came when he was invited to contribute to Le Monde, one of Europe's most respected daily newspapers, on a regular basis. Searle's drawing is remarkable in that I think for a man reaching his later years to have begun again on a new project for Le Monde, which must have invigorated him a great deal, I think, and produced such wonderful drawings, which is so cleverly conceptualized, is an extraordinary achievement. Very important artists constantly renewed themselves, and he did. 
So the quality of the drawings in the Le Monde are marvellous, and the conceptual insights and ideas that reflect the political awareness and social awareness are extraordinary. I don't think there's nobody coming up behind who could do that. It was a great shame, probably for the status of cartoon, because he's our greatest cartoonist, I think, by a mile. I think if he'd stayed around, you know, it'd, it'd be in much better shape. <laughs> Simply because he's such a powerful figure. One of the great pleasures of living in France is that we can get our bottles of champagne straight from the supplier and that uh, the day is over and the glass of champagne is bubbling and uh, off we go into the next day. You know, uh, there's, there's still a pleasure to be had out, out of clinking the odd glass here and there. generation, everyone you knew died when they were 19 and 20. You've got the biggest present in the world. You're, you live from day to day thinking, my God, you know, I should have died when I was 19 and I'm 85 now. And I'm obviously making, for me, I'm making the best I can of every second I have of my life. He's influenced the best. All the great illustrators, cartoonists, all, all know him and all have him at the back of their mind. What does Ronald Searle mean to me? Or what image do I have when I think, when I think of him? I usually think of, of, of one of his characters, um, and probably one of his characters who got this kind of glorious pessimism. Something awful is going to happen. Um, but perhaps it won't, or perhaps it will be less, or perhaps it will be worse than he thinks. And that's what I think. How does he see himself? How does he see his own status, sort of thing? Because he is like a god, you know, he really is. All I do see him is I see his stature. to the world and worse things than uh, you or I will ever see and that's always in the background you know it's lurking there and uh, I hope he sleeps well I have no evidence that he doesn't by now he certainly deserves to I see trees of green the wildlife of Gerald Darrell tomorrow night with BBC4 on BBC2 at the same time, 11.20. For me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Tomorrow on 2, 